All right. <laughs> Hebrews. <clears throat> Chapter 10. And we've been talking about not becoming legalistic. <laughs> That's, again, this kind of <laughs> one of the <laughs> subjects of the book is not getting into... For them, it was these sacrifices, the sacrificial system, the priesthood. Um, some people, it's today the same way. They need to hear this. Um, in fact, all people need to hear this. Uh, that have, whether you think that you need to go through a priest or go <coughs> through any human, it's, it's false. That's, that's religion. Yeah. In fact, there's so much in the sacrificial system that teaches us not to rely on um, man's obedience or man's faithfulness. But really, it points, doesn't it, so much to the perfect and greatest sacrifice of all. That's the book of Hebrews is about. It's the greatest, better, we see those words throughout, throughout the book, a better priest, a better than the angels, uh, just a better sacrifice. Well, tonight, it's, it's uh, not just a better sacrifice, but the perfect sacrifice all, of all time. And so, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, continuing with this same thought of uh, the, the contrast, and maybe it's good to review the, the great contrast that he brought up in chapter 9, how temporary the, the priesthood is them coming and bringing sacrifices, how that was just a temporary thing. He's going to really hammer that point home here in chapter 10. So verse 1, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, they can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect or Mature, or, or we would say complete. Um, so again, just the, the yeah. you, you see this contrast of temporary, just year by year, they had to do what they did, but they could never do uh, what Jesus did, and that's the end of verse 1, continually make the comers perfect or complete. He continues to do that. So verse 2, For then would they not have ceased to be offered, or stopped, because that the worshippers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou would not, but I would, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and in sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and offering for sin, thou would not, uh, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. Verse 10. By the which, the second, that is, by the which will... We are, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered once uh, one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his foot, footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost 
also is a witness unto us. To after that he had said before, verse 16, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Here's a precious verse. I've got it underlined in mine. Verse 17, right? And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. <laughs> Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Here's the title of our message from verse 20. By a new and living way, which He has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of, the, of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto a love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. I love ending where it reminds us what it's all about again. Our hope. We see the day approaching. And so, and we do. We should, they did then and we do today. But we'll stop and that's a big chunk to chew on that we just read. Um, first of all, the reason why God told the children of Israel in the first place to bring offerings, to bring sacrifices. It was all, verse 1 of chapter 10, shadows, shadow of good things to come. And not the very image of the thing. So, the lamb that would be brought and sacrificed was not the very image. <laughs> Whatever the, the sacrifice that you brought, it was not the image so, who is the image? Jesus Christ. The book of Colossians makes it abundantly clear. He is the image of the invisible God. That's Jesus Christ. There's no one else. He's the image of all of these sacrifices. All of the offerings. All of the priesthood ordinances and, and things that they, they went through and, and did. All of the, these were pointing us to Jesus Christ. Making not just atonement for sins, but taking away sin. Ultimately, no sacrifice could do that. That's what's so revolutionary <laughs> at the time that the writer's writing this. And the Hebrews, the, those Christians, and that's all this book is written to, it's good to be reminded, it's Christians that were Jewish before. They had converted from the, the religious way that they had been brought up in. So they knew these sacrifices well. Yeah. They were more familiar with them than we are. But I love the quote from the book of Psalms. Because it shows us, and the writer of he, the book of Hebrews is pointing them back to where you guys can read this. <laughs> in, the, in your Torah. In your Old Testament, you can read this in Psalm verse 40, verses 6 through 8, where he quotes right there. It's from Psalm 40, 6 through 8. You uh, are sacrifice and offering. That's not what I desire. And it's, it's something that we all kind of need to get into our head is it doesn't matter that we're sacrificing when we come to church. It doesn't matter what we're giving up. So that we might no, it's it's again, what is God what is it that He desires? A relationship. Love. It's just this relationship that we have with the Lord. Where we there's no place we'd rather be. That's the song that we sang. 
Better is one day. We really ought to say better is one second. <laughs> better is one second in your presence, Lord, in your house, than thousands that, are, that would be spent somewhere else. And it, it's really true. Uh, we can get, and, and the whole religious mentality comes from this whole idea of sacrifice. And, and how much I've given up. Look how holy I am. <laughs> You know, I've worn the same pair of underwear now for 20 years. Thinking that that somehow is going to make you more righteous in the sight of God. <laughs> we laugh and chuckle, but people do that. Superstitions. They love to hold on to rituals and rites and, and all kinds of things that they... And when you're brought up in it, sometimes it's what you know. It's more familiar to you. Uh, it's comfortable. And God comes along, well, the writer of the book of Hebrews here, comes along and just knocks all of those things down. Those things that they would hold to so, uh, so tightly and, and dear to, the, to their hearts. They, it, was, it only took a work of the Holy Spirit that caused Paul, the apostle, to see these things. Remember, no, you could tell them until you're blue in the face, but you couldn't convince, convince them, and God knew that, so it took him getting blinded on, on his way, right? Acts chapter 9. That, that's what it takes for someone that's really hung up in all of this, holding to the, to the uh, sacrifices, the whole system. The whole point of all of it, right, was... To make and really show our need. And it does make one very aware of his sin. That's one thing that was good about it. The children of Israel were very aware of their sins. Um, in fact, verse 3 is interesting the way that it, it is phrased there. In those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. <laughs> there is for us too. Imagine, just for a second now, imagine if you only went to church once a year. <laughs> and you put your tithe in, you, you took communion, you, you did your thing. Imagine, that's, that verse applies to you, big time, <laughs> in that way. If you think that you going to church that one time a year is what wipes away your sins. Or covers them for a time meaning being. But guess what? Next year's coming, and there's a remembrance of your sins. Jesus Christ, jump over to verse 17, right? The way, the new and living way, what we're reading about, I will remember your sins no more. Yeah. The best way to put it, because we've heard, and actually that word atonement is a cover. You know, the Old Testament, you brought the sacrifice the lamb, whatever it was, and you put your hand on that lamb's head. And by the way, it was a male unblemished. Right out the gate, that lets you know, doesn't it? A hint. Who's a male that's unblemished? Jesus Christ. <laughs> and placing your hand on the head of that lamb, that little innocent lamb, you were identifying with that lamb. That, that was a way of doing it, placing your hand on the sacrifice. But even doing that and going through all of that only covered, it only just kind of put this atonement or covering over the sin, and then a year later it would have to be done again. And somebody came up with the analogy of, uh, again, getting pulled over. You say you're going 80 and a 25. I do that every day. <laughs> and you get pulled over. You see the lights behind you. He gets out and gives you a ticket. And, and, and it's raining. And he drops that ticket in the, in the puddle there and then picks it back up, gives it to you. You better show up at court. Okay? Go to court. Right? And you find out the fine for what you did before you go into the courtroom, was $5,000. Oh and the 
judge looks at the ticket and he says, you're here for an offense and I can't really make this out, the offense. I, I see that you've, you've violated something, but it's been blurred, it's been covered with mud or rain or whatever. And, and that's, that's what the sacrifices did. They just smudged something so that the judge of all the universe, God Almighty, would look and see this smudge and really kind of couldn't make out your offense. But when you walked out of that courtroom, if, I, if that happened, that would still be in your conscience. Weighing down, that dropped in the rain, and I know what I was doing. The judge might, it might have been smudged in the mud, covered by the mud, but not, it was not taken away. Same scenario, you get pulled over, you're standing before the judge, and let's say the ticket, he can read it perfectly clear. And he says, you owe $5,000. And then my brother, Matt, walks in the co courtroom and he's loaded. He's got a ton of money. And so he waves out his big wallet and fans it and says, I'd like to pay my brother's thing. <laughs> so, and so he goes and pays it. Guess what happens when I leave then? The conscience is clear. I know that that sin has been not... It's been paid for, and the offense has been what? Taken away. It's, it's totally been paid for. Only with Jesus, with this sacrifice that we're talking about, it's eternal. It's, it's our offenses and the sin, the wages of sin is death, not $5,000. <laughs> the wages of sin is ultimate judgment and, and uh, hell. He's not yeah. To pay back <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's not expecting me to pay him back. Too. That's, that's true. <laughs> but it's really true, and we should, we should see that. that uh, that's what the writer of the, the book of Hebrews here is doing. He's pointing out they could only cover. In fact, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away. And John caught on to that, didn't he? John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God who just covers sin. No, John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He caught on to this. He knew this was the Lamb. This was the sacrifice that would come and make a way. And not only that, bringing in a whole, verse uh, 20, a new and living way. See, the priest, no matter how good he could be, the high priest, and none of them were really good. <laughs> Wait a minute. But, but the high priest, the high priest would die one day. He would die. Jesus lives forever. That's this new and living way that the that the uh, writer here wants to draw all of our attention to, and especially them, we could come into the holiest. That's the Holy of Holies, by the way. By the blood of Jesus Christ. And again, they sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. Our hearts are sprinkled. Not on the mercy seat, but from an evil conscience. And our bodies are washed with pure water. What's that all about? The blood of Jesus that sprinkles and, and cleanses us from all iniquity. And then the water of His Word. The pure water of His Word is what we, what we wash in. Ephesians chapter 5 makes that connection for us. We're, we're washed and, and made clean by the, wa the uh, washing of the water of the Word of God. So, and you can't Skip verse 25. That was a highlighted verse, especially during lockdown and what that, that whole thing. This was a huge verse that came to, to life during just, just those, these past few years. We should never forsake, as is the manner of some. It's become a manner of many in our, in our day uh, so much so but with with uh, YouTube, with Zoom, with Facebook Live, 
<laughs> with, <the pipe. laughs> with tuning in to things from your screen, you're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Where you're not, you're not around other people to pray after. To spend some time talking about it with other people. There's something about coming together and especially singing. In a room, singing together with others. If you're only watching that from a screen and trying to sing along with a, a screen, it's empty. <laughs> it's really hard to do. There's something about coming together and singing. That's, that's more than special. It's holy. <laughs> it's incredibly holy. If they had to come in with an animal and slit its throat and have the blood drain in proper ways, how dare anyone ever complain, when I go to church, I have to sing. <laughs> have you ever had to kill an animal, slaughter it, make sure the blood drains the right way, cut it up, and then cause it, you know, Burn it in these particular ways and in a particular order. What are you whining about? You know? And we know, don't we? It's a pleasure to come into the house of God and just with singing. We enter in with thanksgiving, with singing. Praises on our lips. And so much the more, the end of verse 25, we do all of this so much the more as you see the day approaching. Again, hinting at, always kind of reminding me and you and the reader, <laughs> Jesus Christ is coming back. That day is approaching. The day of the Lord. For if we sin willfully, here's the, here's the heavy one. <laughs> A lot of people don't like going through Hebrews. And this was one of the other verses here. Verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Wow. The idea in that is no other way to have your sins paid for. Jesus remains the only sacrifice. The only way. And if you say, well, I know Jesus did that, but I'm going to just sin willfully, live my life, in a lifestyle of sin, by the way, oh. nailing this down, whether it's getting married to somebody, <laughs> and nailing that will to the thing, this is permanent, by the way, marriage is permanent, it's meant to be, that is willfully going on in a lifestyle of sin, after you've received the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and His death. There is no other. There remains no other sacrifice. Jesus is the only way. That's, that's the way of, of really looking at that. But there's a, there's a warning, isn't there? <laughs> Take heed. Verse 27. But a certain fearful looking for a judge, for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law um, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. And by the way, everything becomes official under two or three witnesses. Everything. That's biblical. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought uh, worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant the blood of Jesus Christ, wherewith he was sanctified a holy thing, an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Here it is. Another one to underline. Verse 31, right? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Wow. You're not messing with a big teddy bear. <laughs> God is not some is not to be likened to some pet <laughs> or some genie in the sky. And so many could get it, get this idea of God that that frankly is just not not biblical. 
Yeah. It comes from our kind of cartoons or children's books even um, being brought up in, in different, you know, cultures. You can find yourself thinking of God as this kind of friendly, uh, I don't know, human-like. Um, and he, he's not, you know. God, that's what makes God, God. In fact, we, we kind of, I think, miss it so often because the whole idea of Jesus becoming a man was radical. Um, we really don't understand that. Uh, God Almighty choosing to become man is, is uh, really unthinkable. God Almighty is not a man that He should change. He's, he's uh, to be feared. We, we have incredible reverence for Him. It's one of the reasons, again, we come before Him with singing. We lift our hands to Him. We do things, and it's sad, but it's true, we do things to humans that really it belongs to God. We give them all of our attention. We hear every word or whatever that's coming out. Um, we memorize uh, words to songs. We don't even realize. And we don't, we don't memorize Scripture. We should. We should have Scripture memorized. But instead we have... Elvis Presley's songs memorized. <laughs> or we have, you fill in the blank. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He's a living God. Meaning, He's not dead. It's not like the rest of the gods of the world. He's holy. This is, this is His, and He calls you His dwelling place. The church. You are the church, by the way. The sticks, the bricks, the chairs, the floor, the ceiling has nothing to do with the church. We are the church. The dwelling place of the living God. And guess what? God is righteous. He judges perfectly. That's the whole idea. We will all fall into the hands of the living God. It should scare the far out of all of us. <laughs> It should scare us half to death because He's the righteous judge that judges perfectly. You do not want Him to see Mike Weatherly. You do not want Him to see you. Who do you want Him to see? Jesus Christ. The righteous. <laughs> right? And that's, that's the whole thing here. You could be covered with all the blood of all the lambs, and it still doesn't match up to, to Jesus Christ. You could be <laughs> living your life perfectly in such a way, but it doesn't match up. It could never. From the very beginning, this has been, you know, Adam and Eve fell in the garden. First thing they did, let's cover ourselves. Let's cover ourselves. When sin entered the world, the first thing that happened was man's attempt to cover himself. So this is ingrained in all of us. We want to cover ourselves. It's all good, God. We got it. I'm good. I've covered myself. I got myself covered. And God says, isn't that itchy? That just looks... That, that can't work. And God, at the very beginning, slaughters and kills an innocent animal. We don't know what animal. But He clothed them with what? Skin from an animal. Did the animal deserve to die? No, that's the whole point. By innocent blood, your sins will be covered. From the very beginning there in the garden, God was establishing Jesus Christ is the only innocent blood, by the way. There's no other innocent blood in the world. Jesus Christ is the only innocent blood that could cover sins for all of eternity. And He's got you covered. <laughs> don't try and cover yourself. That was the first religion. I don't know if it's called 
Adamism, Eveism. But it was the first religion was Adam and Eve trying, taking those fig leaves, sewing them together, as it says, doing it, you know, we've got to cover ourselves. We've got to cover our shame. Shame never did. <laughs> and we've got to do something about this. It was only natural, but that's sin. That's what sin caused us, and it still causes, and it's religion that says you can cover yourselves. Here's our pamphlet. Here's who you need to go get baptized by. Here's the steps you need to take. Here's the prayer you need to say. You can cover yourself. That is, there's a, a Greek word for it, balakmia. Yeah. Baloney, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it, it, there's no, there is no way that you can cover your own wickedness, your own shame. But call to remembrance now. The former days in which after you were illuminated or the light came on, you endured a great, uh, a great fight of afflictions. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compa compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. And will not tarry. Now the just shall live. How? By faith. This is going to go along with next week's study. We will read this again next week. But the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of, him, of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So, and we'll get into faith in all next week in that incredible chapter, the Hall of Faith, right? Where you, you get into this whole thing. But <clears throat> it's placing your faith, isn't it? What is your faith placed in? Are they in fig, fig leaves? <laughs> Thinking that that will cover you, that will do it? Is it in anything? <laughs> We, we can find ourselves doing things ritualistically, um, praying in such a way, uh, thinking that, it's, that it somehow makes you more right before God. Placing your faith in no other, none other than Jesus Christ. That's where our faith needs to be. And, and we'll get into that more. But call to remembrance the things you endured. The great fight of afflictions. This is why most people attribute this letter, by the way, to Paul. Because he says, in my bonds, doesn't he? And you can hear him saying there in verse 34, You had compassion on me in my bonds. <laughs> in my chains, when I was in prison. We know Paul was in prison and wrote many letters from prison. So it's very possible that Paul wrote this book. And of course, I'll talk a little more about the reason that I think Paul wrote this. is uh, It's a part of a trilogy that he wrote. Romans, Galatians, and here in Hebrews, those, those words from Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith, are brought up in Romans, and it's brought up in Galatians, and it's brought up here in Hebrews. But those same scripture is referred to, and those letters, you could take those two words. The just is the book of Romans. Let you know what's the just. What's that all about, to be just? The book of Romans tells you. Shall live, read the book of Galatians. It's going to show you how to, how to live. How the just shall live. And here we get to Hebrews, and how, what's the context? Those last two words. By faith. Especially coming up into next week's chapter there. 
So you have this incredible trilogy. And even if it's not the Apostle Paul that wrote it, the Holy Spirit gave us this trilogy there in the book of Romans, book of Galatians, and here in Hebrews. But people are going to scoff. The world will mock. And there should be some adversaries. <laughs> there should be enemies that come along when you walk with God. Everything that Jesus experienced, we should experience <laughs> as His followers, right? We're obedient to Him. And so following in His footsteps, you should be a reproach. You should be a gazing stock. People look at you and go, what in the world is that? <laughs> a Christian? And they don't look at you, by the way, because you've got you know, green hair, blue hair, whatever it is. That's not why you're a gazing stock. It's that Jesus grin on your face. It's the fact that everywhere you go, you're bringing up Scripture and Jesus. Or you have a Bible in your hand. They look at you and they're like, what in the world is wrong with you? You don't belong to the world. <laughs> and, me, and, and we have, I love the end of verse 34 there, you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Doesn't compare to anything this world has to offer. Anything <laughs> that this world has to offer. It, it really doesn't. When you fall in love, it's true. There's nothing else that matters. It's, it's like this incredible... I love the book of Song of Solomon just for that. Uh, I was being refreshed on that book because I taught through it when we were in the tent. And one of the very first lines in the book of Song of Solomon says, it, it's to the... I'm going to butcher it, but it's... it's I don't need wine. I have you. And it's, it's you're greater than any... The whole idea of that is just like when the Nazarite took his vow. He didn't eat anything from the fruit of the vine. No wine, no strong drink, nothing from the fruit of the vine. Why? Because that's what the world had to offer. And what, what the Song of Sol Solomon is saying there is... You're so much better than anything this world has to offer. And the picture of, of Christ and His bride, the church, is so clearly seen in that. But, and we say that. We should say, Lord, you, you are so much better than anything this world might throw at me and offer me. Some vacation, some amusement park, some whatever. Music or, or concert or... Uh, Things that the world are just into. That when you belong to the world, go for it. That's what, if this is all there is, but in heaven, Paul, or sorry, I slipped. The writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, in heaven, right, you have a much better and an enduring substance. It's not fleeting. And Jesus would say, where moth and rust do not destroy, and no thief can break in and take it. Aren't you glad our God is not some half man, half fish that can just be stolen and taken and the head falls off. you got to prop it back up. <laughs> we, we have an enduring substance, a living God that, that again, He's powerful, mighty, and so so incredible when we read through these things. It's, it really is. It's an incredible thing. And the atonement, Jesus doesn't just atone for your sins. Doesn't, the, the, that word atonement is cover. Just a covering. Jesus takes away even the conscience, the guilt, the, the things that would haunt you otherwise. I'm so glad I don't confess to some priest in a little booth somewhere. It would haunt me. My conscience would bug me. 
Jesus died, and what did we just read to? Once for all. That was it. <coughs> Don't let them put Jesus back on the cross. Don't let them convince you that this cracker is actually the body. Don't let them convince you that, that, his, that it magically turns into the blood. Jesus died once for all. And it, it is more than sufficient. You do not want to be among those that there is no more sacrifice. You don't want to be, because it, it does, it, it explains, doesn't it? As we just read, you've trodden underfoot what Jesus did on the cross. It's as if you're just slapping that whole thing and spitting and join, basically joining in with, with the soldiers there at the scene with everybody around, you're just concurring and agreeing with them as you cover yourself. As you confess to some person that can't do anything about it. No, confess your sins. He is faithful. When we confess our sins to Him, to God Almighty, He is faithful and just to forgive us. And there's that, that verse 17 becomes not only just all the more real, it becomes personal for you, for me. Verse, verse 17 say, I don't know, read it. <laughs> Your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. That's precious. Because all of us can take that personally. We know there's things, and we can't forget those things, those sins, those it it does, but God has this incredible ability to just I will remember them no more. I cast them in the sea of forgetfulness. <coughs> Thank you, Lord, that you became <coughs> sin for us, that you are more than sufficient, Lord. You're the perfect sacrifice. And the only way, Lord, there was no other way. There is, there is no other way. And we see how, as we go through this book, as we go through Hebrews, <coughs> Hebrews especially, Lord, what a better sacrifice you are. What a greater high priest. And how, Lord, for you, it's forever. Lord, we can only do so much through the old way, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. But Lord, this new and living way, how true it is, Lord, it is <coughs> living. And you are the living God that desires to be indwelling in mankind. And it's we're just so blessed and so honored as we just sing. All we can do is respond by singing and praising, worshiping you all the more. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. <coughs>